am Dr. Pam Gilchrist, and I'm the director of Imhotep and Karen Anderson Academy at the Science House of NC State. Today, we're chatting with Dr. Rob Dunn. Rob is a biologist, writer, and professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University. His science essays have appeared in publications such as BBC Wildlife Magazine, Scientific American, Smithsonian Magazine, and National Geographic. Also, he's the author of five books, including the New York Times book review editor's choice, Never Home Alone, From Microbes to Millipedes, Camel Cricket and Honeybees, The Natural History of Where We Live. He is well known for efforts to involve the public as citizen scientists in arthropod surveys and bacterial flora studies. Some of his projects include studies of belly button biodiversity, mites that live on human faces, ants in backyards, and fungi and bacterial bacteria in houses. Rob, thank you for joining us. We are so excited to get to talk with you today. Oh, it's great to get a chance to talk to you today, Pam. Yes, awesome. So we're just going to start off with, we would love to know what got you interested in studying life and homes and on our bodies? Well, I started off studying rainforests. So when I was a graduate student, I worked in Bolivia and Costa Rica and Peru and Australia and around the world and had this idea that to make big discoveries, you had to go far away. And, and slowly as my career progressed, I started to realize that many of the things that we were discovering in faraway forests weren't understood in backyards. And so we started really shifting my lab from thinking about forests to what what's go, goes on in backyards like I'm actually in my backyard now. So, you know, which species live out here that nobody studies and what, do we, what can we learn about them? And as we started to do that, it became clear that one of the groups of people best able to help us study places like that were people in their own homes. And you know, it's, it's, so it's hard for us to show up at somebody's house and say, especially hard right now, you know, let me into your backyard, let me see what's there. But, but it's way easier to engage you, Pam, and to say like, can you look in your backyard and you tell me what you're seeing there? And so as we started to do that work, we found new species in backyards, we found totally new phenomena, we found an ant, um, or rather my student, Bill Maginar, found an ant uh, that was not known to be in North Carolina. It turns out to be like the most common introduced ant species in Raleigh and Durham. And, and so it was in backyards all over Raleigh. It was all over campus. And then when he studied it, he found um, that it does a totally new kind of recruiting to food. So if it finds food, the workers go back to the, the colony and they grab other workers and carry them to the food and throw them at it. And so that's, you know, is that the most important thing in the world? Well, no, pro probably not, but it's a totally new kind of behavior right in people's backyards. And so we started doing that work um, and, and it kind of th then inched closer and closer to people's houses. And I would go and give talks and people would say, well, yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks a lot. But what do I do about the ants in my kitchen? And, and for me, it was kind of this, like, that's a frustrating question because, uh, you know, I spent all this time studying, you know, these species because I love them. I think they're fascinating. And, and here somebody wants to know, like, well, how do I kill them? And it took me a while to realize that what, what that question really meant was, thanks for your boring hour-long talk. The only way this potentially relates to my daily life is with regard to what's going on in my kitchen. And eventually I realized that there was actually nobody studying that. There was nobody who could tell you what was going on with the ants in your kitchen. And so we started to move into actually thinking about what's going on in houses. And as we did, we realized that there were not a couple of species in houses, not just that ant in the kitchen, which turns out to be a bunch of kinds of ants. But actually, you know, we're now up to thinking that there are hundreds of thousands of species living in houses around the world with very few people studying them. And, and so it was, it was that kind of trajectory that led us to houses. And, and now in many ways, we've, we've not left because there's so much to study um, that will be there for a while. And now that we're all in quarantine, you know, it, it's the easiest place to study. My lab is shut, but my kitchen's open. Yeah, for sure. That, that's the amazing part with nature and the things around us. Um, could you share a bit about what drives your passion in your research and something that you recently discovered that surprised you? Yeah, so, so um, for me, I'm just, 
am interested in nature. I'm interested in how nature relates to the big human story. Um, and, and I have the good fortune to work, to work as a biologist as an adult, which is kind of this amazing treat. Um, and, and so one of the things that, that I find a lot of joy in is being able to share the stories I experience at work with people at their homes. You know, and so I go when I'm when our university is open, I get to go down the hall and everybody in my hallway is making some kind of discovery. Mm. And, and I hear about those, you know, I hear about them when we're drinking coffee. I, and so one of my joys is both learning about those things and getting to share them. Um, you know, the guy across the hall from me just figured out there are these really unusual microbes in caviar that nobody knew about that may help caviar stay fr fresh and safe. Um, wow. You know, farther down the hall, um, you know, Becky Irwin is figuring out that some bees appear to eat specific foods that they use as medicines to keep their guts healthy. And so part of my joy is, is sharing those kinds of stories. But then, of course, there's also the bit of figuring out the stories. And so, for example, um, I was part of a study a few years ago where we were considering these mites that live on our faces and all adults have them, kids don't have them, kids get them as they age. Mm -hmm. um, and the group I was working with, when we first started studying them, we thought that the two species that live on human faces are each other's closest relatives. And then, and then as we started to study them, they look really similar, they both live in the follicles. It turned out that they're 130 million years different. And, and so, they're not even close to being each other's closest relatives. They're two totally different stories of these two relatively unrelated animals that live on our heads. And nobody realized that. And so like, that's a, that seems like a weird, obscure story. Why should we even care about it? Except if you then start to think about these mites, they're probably the most abundant animal on earth. And, and our lab is one of three in the world that study them. And, and so, you know, there are all kinds of things we could discover about them. Or we've recently been working with sourdough bread. So to make sourdough bread, you take flour and water, mix them together, and the bacteria and fungi colonize um, the flour and water, and they allow the, the starter to, to, to rise. So the yeast produce CO2, and to become acidic, the bacteria produce acid. And, but it's kind of magical where those microbes come from in the first place. And we were able to show in a study in Belgium that when, when bakers make sourdough, that some of the microbes are coming from their hands mm -hmm. and, and that we can actually taste the flavor of an individual baker in the bread they make. But the other thing we discovered is when we looked at the baker's hands is that upwards of 70% of the microbes in their hands are actually from starter environments. And so they're changing their bread, but by making this bread, uh, they're also being changed. And to us, that was cool because then it made us think, well, what, what is each of us doing in our daily environment and how is it changing who and how we are? And so every time we come around some corner, there, there's one of these kinds of things. Or we have a study right now of salt and salt shakers um, and what's living in them. And, and we're finding that in the individual salt grains are bacteria that, that live in the salt grains and some of those may be thousands of, or even tens of thousands of years old. And they got into the salt grain when the grain ori originally formed. And so your, your salt is part of this ecosystem. And so each, each place you go in the house, there's one of these little corners to turn around. And sometimes we get to turn the corner and sometimes somebody else does, but it brings me joy. I really like that too. Like the work you do, it not only does it impact you, but it has larger ramifications beyond. Um, one thing I've learned from you over the years is how little we still know about anything and everything. Many of those watching think that we've discovered almost everything that is going to be discovered. Would you respond to this? Yes. So it's the, at any moment in the history of science, it's what scientists have tended to think, that most of what's discoverable has been discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and we're always wrong about that. Um, you know, for a while, scientists tried to estimate how many species on Earth there might be. And we've kind of given up, in part because the conclusion is we're still so ignorant that we can't come up with a good estimate. 
and and so you know something like six out of every ten insect species is not yet named. Um, a recent estimate suggested that there are trillions of species of bacteria, which is to say, like just a teeny handful have been named. Most of the bacteria on you, Pam, are not yet named on me. Um, and 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 naming things is kind of this like old fashioned part to science. Like, you know, we, we go when we go forth and, and name the things about us. Um, but it's also an indication of what we do and don't know, because if we haven't named it, it also means we haven't attached any science to the name. You know, we don't know. It's the first step. Um, another example is it's only a few years ago that like when I was a student and, you know, I'm bald, but I'm not so, so old. Um, or maybe I'm intermediate for this audience, but the, uh, well, let's not stay there too long. Anyway, when I was a student a while ago, uh, I was taught that the appendix has no function. In my daughter's science te biology textbook, it, it's still what it says. Um, she's 14. Um, but a few years ago, uh, it was discovered that in fact, the appendix does have a function. Um, and and I'll, I'll leave the audience to wonder about what that function is. But, but I think it's amazing. Here's an organ in the body that we don't quite know about. Um, another example that I like and is relevant to coronavirus, which is that uh, human lungs all have a fungus that lives in them, and we don't really know what it does. It's in everybody. Every mammal species has their own version of it. It might be protective. It might do nothing. It's not really actively studied. And, and so everywhere... Um, is the unknown and and for students um if you go to the doctor the frustrating thing about the unknown is we don't know right that, that to, if you're suffering from some problem this is a it's awful that unknown is awful at the same time if you're a student wanting to do science like everything you could imagine is discoverable is still discoverable Right. And in some ways, it's the most exciting time to be a scientist, to be a, you know, a teenage scientist, to be a scientist becoming in the sense that um, uh, we have the best tools we've ever had for doing science. And yet the unknown is still gaping. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, when I started off as a, a student, I couldn't imagine that we could go around a house and take dust samples and identify all the species in the dust based on their DNA. That now costs us like $10, $10 you know, for a sample. Um, I just got an email today that we're going to be able to look at some samples from the space station um, but by taking all the little bits of genes. And I want to figure out, you know, which, um, which uh, are there animal species in the space station we don't know about that we could detect based on the DNA. It wasn't conceivable even 10 years ago. And so what's possible in 15 years that we can't think about yet? Um, amazing, amazing things. Uh, and some of those are just fun, amazing. Some of them solve major societal cha challenges. There's a faculty member not far from um, uh, the Science House building um, who right now is working on technologies to scrub CO2 from the air and power plants and suck it back in um, using new enzymes in these new kinds of textiles. And so it com combines like knowing about textiles, knowing about societal need, knowing about enzymes, knowing about microbes, which I think is the other thing here, which is that as we get more technologies, we're gonna even more need students who are trained to think about those technologies in light of um, history, art, uh, you know, anthropology, all, any other field you can imagine, because we still need to make sense of these stories in light of our own human story. And for me, that's a beautiful part. That it's one thing to have a technique, but if you just have a technique, you're a robot. Right. And, and what makes us great is to be able to contextualize those techniques to, to both see and think. True. And I, you make a great point of, of indicating that we have to be able to work across disciplines and be open to what is available and to inquire. So yeah, that's, absolutely. That's really, that's really powerful. And even now, you know, we live in a different world today than we did even two months ago. I think many of us have never imagined that we would be walking through what we're walking through. And, you know, everyone is sterilizing everything. 
People like to think that they are home alone and go to great lengths to kill any and every organism in their house. Um, what is your perspective on this? Is this a wise practice? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. So for sure, people need to be doing all the social distancing things that we're advised right now. Um, they need to be washing their hands. Uh, they, you know, it doesn't hurt to think about washing some of the stuff that's coming into your house when it's coming into your house. At the same time, we know that on our bodies, in our homes, are these other microbes we depend on. And so there's this kind of balancing that happens between warding off the, the species we don't want around and, and keeping around the species we do need. Um, and, and so I think it's a challenging time in that regard. And I, I think one thing we can do is, for those of us who can still get outside, which is not true for everybody right now, to get outside, to make sure you're still being exposed to the microbes in nature, to, to make fermented foods where you're being exposed to these beneficial microbes that can help your gut, um, while at the same time being sure to wash your hands. You know, so what can we do to, to keep, keep the, the bad stuff at bay while making sure we're not losing those good interactions? That gets harder in places where you can't get outside. You know, Spain, for the last weeks, kids haven't been able to go outside at all. And, and there it's a, it's a bigger challenge. Um, but, but it's also one of these situations where there's not a simple answer. And it's also, which makes it all the more valuable to have many different insights into these kinds of questions. And so we have a little panel on campus where we think about COVID-19 and how to deal with it. And every week we meet, we realize, oh, we need somebody else on our panel. We need a historian. Ooh, we need an ec economist. Ooh, ooh, this is only going to make sense in the context of art. And, and, so, and so I think as we go through these challenges, to go back one, one question a little bit, um, they are going to be hard, but we are, we are going to need diverse perspectives to make the most sense of them. Um, and, and, and so there won't be one answer to how to best interface with the species around us and it's going to change through time and it's different if you're immunocompromised it's different if you're over 60 um all of these things but it's easy to forget when we're latched into our own story i think yeah oh great um nature has a, an amazing way of um keeping you happy but then there can be things that are quite scary about nature to people so what are some things yeah. you can share to people who say, well, nature really isn't my thing. N nature isn't my thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, so, so um, uh, yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. So, um, so I think one, th one thing to think about um, is to realize that all these other beings around you um, have their own perspective on the world. Each of our perspectives is limited. And so like, I think spiders are a good example. A lot of people don't like spiders. I know that. If, if you hate spiders, Pam, do you hate spiders? No, I don't hate them, but you, all know, right, you all have right. a lot of them that just crawl around at times, yeah. Perfect. Well, some people do hate spiders. I won't convince them to suddenly love spiders. <laughs> but I, I can, I can, I think, I, I think there is a useful conversation to be had though about the way in which their world is so different from our own that it can help us tell, it can help tell us about things we're missing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the spider lives in a world of feelings, of vibrations. What does it sense about your own home that you don't sense? What does it see about your house that you don't sense? Mm -hmm. The ant walking through your house, it tastes with its feet. What, what does a world like that mean? Um, you know, the bacteria that are moving through, through your house, some are actually moving from place to place. They're perceiving chemicals you don't even know are there. And, and, so, and so I think um, on the one hand, you, to know that these other beings have other lenses into our world, M mice in your house. Lots of people have mice in their house. It's just, um, th they can sing melodically, but they, they sing in the ultrasound. And so we don't hear them. And, and so this was just discovered a few years ago. And so in your house is a whole world of song you don't even know is there. And so I think this is one piece, these different perspectives. Yeah. Um, I think another piece is for every an innovation we've ever had as humans, we rely in some way on insights we've gathered from other species. 
And so you could hate a species in your house, in your backyard, that will nonetheless save you one day. The, the drugs we use um, to suppress immune systems from heart transplants come from a fungus that's natural biology is that it invades dung beetles and takes over their immune system to control them so it can grow through them. We take advantage of its chemistry to allow heart transplants to be possible. Um, you know, the antibiotics we use to fight bacteria come originally from fungi that we're relying on them to, to fight bacteria. The camel crickets in our basements, um, they have microbes in their guts that we think can help us get rid of some of our uh, industrial waste. Um, the, the wasps in our house that you might run from and tell somebody else to, well, one might run from, I don't know, but you, you don't run from wasp, Pam, I know. Um, Jason Painter of the Science House runs from wasps, yes, I know. But, but the, uh, um, and it's, it's not pretty, but the, the so, so one might run, run, run from wasps. At the same time, we know that the yeasts that are in the guts of wasps are the same yeast we rely on um, to make many kinds of bread and beer. And, and so you, you cannot like these species and still appreciate the role that they have to play. Um, and then I would say the other piece is that we, it's increasingly clear that we, we depend on an exposure to a diversity of species for our own health and well-being. At the same time, that we're trying to keep COVID, you know, the virus that causes COVID-19 away from ourselves, our immune systems to work normally need to be exposed to <clears throat> soil microbes and leaf microbes and ordinary skin and gut microbes. And so, you, so if you really don't like nature, it's also, in some way, you're also not liking yourself because you are nature, right? You are these connections among species. Yes. And so, and so love nature, love yourself. I think that's the, I'll close there. Awesome, I love that. It, it's really relevant. And um, one of your recent projects, the Never Home Alone, the Wildlife of Homes, um, we have challenged our viewers to participate in this project. And this was part of our Experimental Wednesday video released this week. So what do you want families engaged in this project to learn? And how does society benefit when citizens participate? And projects like this. Yeah, yeah. So what's become clear when we studied we studied 40 houses in Raleigh, North Carolina, for the um, to figure out which insects and their relatives lived in those houses, and we found almost 2,000 species. Mm -hmm. And what we realized in doing that is there were all kinds of species of insects and their relatives in houses we didn't know about. But we can't go into people's houses all around the world to figure out what's there. And so what we would love is for people to use this project to take pictures of the species in their houses. So we can, we can figure out, are there new species to science in your house that we can name together? Are there useful species in your house? Are there species that are problematic that we didn't know were present in your house? For example, we just had a participant find a stink bug in Florida that maybe is problematic for agriculture that we didn't know was in the region and it was in the participant's house. And, and so it's, it's by shining a light on these other species that we can make more sense of what's going on around us. And also I think, you know, if, if we don't know the animal species, the very least we might know about the world around us is what animal species we work, wake up with every day. Um, and so it seems like a first step in starting to know the world and it's easy. Um, and we will write scientific papers about this work, the participants that contribute the most um, the images to this project will actually be collaborators on the papers they'll be co-authors on the papers and so it's really a way to be part of science yeah. well that that's what i love about you rob you find a way to weave in people from everywhere across the globe in the work that is really important and have meaningful impacts on the world and i've even began using your our naturalist app and taking images around my home from where I was oh, fantastic. over 40 years ago. So I'm learning about plants and things around my mother's house that I didn't even know what the names of them were. So I encourage every person that is really interested or not even interested to download the app and give it a go. And how, how does your mother feel about that? Oh, she's fine. She, right. she, she's fine with it. She is, she is. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Well, that, well, that's great. Thank you so much, Pam. Are you welcome? Is there anything else you would like to share with us? Oh, that, I, that, that's all I've got. Yeah.
Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Rob. Next week, we will be speaking with another great scientist, so be sure to join in. Until next time, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Additional information can be found in the description below. Thank you for watching our Science House Express chat. See you next week. Thank you.